your hit parade, starring Frank Sinatra. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? And now, smile a while with Lorenzo Jones and his wife, Belle. Here's the Manhattan merry-go-round that brings you the bright side of life. That whirls you in music to all the big night spots of New York town. To hear the top songs of the week sung so clearly you can understand every word and sing them yourself. This is the Golden Age of Radio. I'm Dick Bertell, and tonight we'll take you on another audio excursion back to radio's formative years. You'll hear the programs that made the era golden and meet people who made those broadcasts a reality. The Golden Age of Radio with Dick Bertell is brought to you by Burrett Mutual Savings, serving Central Connecticut since 1889, and by WTIC. You'll meet our special guests, actress Mary Jane Higby and her actor husband, Guy Sorrell, after these words from Burrett. For 100% better living, try a Burrett Mutual Savings Bank home improvement loan for that family room, decorating, new kitchen, or new siding. Improving your home will improve your whole outlook on life. It's not just a matter of brick and mortar. It's a matter of comfort and ease, fun and beauty. In fact, it will give your family a whole new dimension of family enjoyment. Burrett has the cash you need. The first move is yours. Either a do-it-yourself estimate or a formal contractor's plan is suitable for your application. Before you know it, your loan will be stamped approved. Home improvement can increase the value of your home and its enjoyment for years to come. Don't wait. Let us make you a home improvement loan tomorrow. Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. And now the host of the Golden Age of Radio, Dick Bertell. Good evening, and with me is the man who makes the golden age of radio possible with his wonderful collection of radio programs, Ed Corcoran. Ed, uh, we've had some uh, rather interesting reaction from listeners and fans of old-time radio to some of our recent programs, and I know that you have contact with many collectors. Whom have they enjoyed the most in, in recent months on the show? Have you heard? Yes, Dick. The, uh, the most popular was the one with Parker Fenley. As you know, he did it in his natural voice, and uh, no one suspected that, uh, that his regular voice was a put-on. I thought that was his regular <laughs> way of speaking. <laughs> and also, of course, the Mary Jane Higby show was, uh, was extremely well uh, thought of because of the book she wrote. Well, of course, that's the reason that we have invited Mary Jane Higby back to uh, be our guest again tonight. It was just about a year ago a little more than a year ago, I guess, that uh, Mary Jane was with us, and uh, we had so much fun that we decided to uh, have not only Mary Jane Higby back on the program, but this time we've an extended an invitation to her husband, Guy Sorrell, who uh, also was a, a very uh, well-known actor. So um, suppose we say hello to our guests. Mary Jane, you uh, were certainly considered the queen of the soap opera when you were in the radio broadcasting medium, weren't you? Well, I think there are several girls that would dispute that. I don't want to find poison in my tea in the morning. No, I would think that Ann Elsner as Stella Dallas was a strong contender for the title, and Julie Stevens as Helen Trent came in very strong. I will send uh, also our gal Sunday, Vivian Smolin, but I will say that uh, When a Girl Marries did hold the highest rating for five consecutive years. It was during the war years. We went on at 5 o'clock in the afternoon on NBC, and it was a very popular time and a very popular show during that period. It was lasted 18 years. I believe, yes, until about 1959. That's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I guess you were on all but one network. You were with NBC, ABC, and CBS with that particular show. With that show. particular show. I yeah. played on all the networks in other shows, you I'm see, because sure we all did. did six or seven a day. Well, Ed, where does uh, Mary Jane Higby's career begin? Well, Dick, it started uh, in uh, California, believe it or not. Uh, Mary Jane, uh, how did your family happen to settle uh, in Hollywood anyway? I was brought up in Hollywood because my father was an actor, and he went out there for D.W. Griffith in films. And I went through public Uh, school in Hollywood. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, that's a long time ago. And uh, when I, well, I was just out of high school and uh, playing in in the theater out there in the stock company. And someone saw me and asked me if I wanted to do a radio show. And I sure did because it was the Depression. You see, radio was, as we knew it then, that type of radio, was the entertainment form 
of the stay-at-home days of the Depression and the gas ration days of the Second World War. So true. Mm -hmm. You see. Let's go back to uh, Hollywood. You weren't with the network at first, and, and we might talk about some of those fantastic salaries that you managed to corner back there in 1932, 1933. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. The first job I had paid me $7, and I think that that covered several cities, that program, and it was half an hour long, and we rehearsed two days <laughs> for it, and I was so happy to see that $7, I cannot tell you, yeah. because really, uh, no one who hasn't lived through it knows what it is to go through a depression like that, because you're not only broke yourself, but you don't know anybody who isn't. There's no, there's nothing to lean on. It's a little like an earthquake. We used to have those, too, quite frequently in uh, Hollywood. And uh, when I remember being on roller skates once in, a, in an earthquake, and there's just nothing to grab. You see, if you grab a post, the post is uh, shaking. There's no place to look, and it was that way in the Depression. So that $7 came in like, oh, it was like the Marines, you mm. know. I didn't knock it at all. I suppose not. And there was a nucleus even then beginning to form people like, uh, well, yourself, of course, and, and John Gail, Gibson. Gail Gordon. I, John Gibson's been on your show, and Gail yeah. Gordon, mm -hmm. Gail, who's a uh, very big star in Hollywood now, and um, Hugh Marlowe, who later became a film star, and Barbara Luddy, who later was the star of The First Nighter. You remember the very popular radio program. I certainly do. The First do. Nighter. The Little, uh, the little th Square. Yes, yes, which took place in Chicago. <laughs> that always pleased me. I loved radio because nothing ever made any sense. I think they're making perhaps a little better sense now, which is spoiled it a little, maybe. Now, Hollywood was not the center for radio in the early 30s when you were working there. No, it certainly wasn't because there was no... Uh, uh, the uh, telephone wires were not set up in a way that made it easy to broadcast from west to east what they called the round robin, which I never understood or knew anything about till I started writing the book. And then I went to an engineer at NBC and said, look, why did it cost Eddie Cantor $1,200 more to broadcast from Hollywood than it did from New York? Because I done found this out during research. And he said, well, it was the round robin, dear. And then he explained to me that that is the skein of telephone wires which form the network. Now, I had been speaking over those networks for, like, 30 years then, and I didn't know it. <laughs> I think I had the idea that everything I said went right straight up to the roof and <laughs> out and into the homes across the nation. I'd never really thought of it. But, of course, I knew the telephone company had something to do with it, but I didn't realize the, uh, the extent that it, uh, the important part it played. And it was in 1937 that they learned to reverse the channels so that they could broadcast directly from the coast. And then there was a great rush of shows from New York to Hollywood. Unfortunately, it was the year I selected to go from Hollywood <laughs> to New York, but that has been the pattern of my whole life experience. <laughs> that out, my well, in your Hollywood area, I was, I do, really, I think I enjoyed in the book, one of the most exciting parts to me was about Bing Crosby. Could you uh, go into that, you know, how the roles changed between uh, when, when you started on his show and how, what happened later on? Yes, it was, was so funny, funny because story. in the very beginning, another thing I had, uh, I got very early on, was the opportunity of doing the commercials on the Bing Crosby show, which was written by Carol Carroll. I mm -hmm. believe he's been a guest yeah, on yes your show, has. too, and he's written a magnificent book, a wonderful book about the subject of the early days because he was right at the creative heart of the industry and knew, knew really what was going on. But uh, he created that great craft show for Crosby and I think created the public image that Crosby later developed. And um, I was paid $15. This interests everybody, I think. <laughs> I got $15. Because I only came in at the end. I didn't have to rehearse all those days. I'd come in, and Ken Carpenter and I would sell a bit of cheese, right? And uh, then years later, when everything, when all of radio was disappearing, or my type of radio, because radio is stronger than it ever has been, but the, t the old uh, dramatic shows and that sort of thing, they were all dying away like flies. And still, I was on the last, I, one of the last, Nora Drake. I was playing Nora Drake at CBS. And... Uh, by golly, then we could use recorded sound, which we'd never been able to use before because the networks wouldn't permit it in the early days. And I hear not only Bing Crosby, but Bing Crosby and Bob Hope <laughs> doing the commercial on my show. <laughs> and I thought, well, we've made some sort of lopsided circle here, but I bet that those boys are getting more than $15. <laughs> I haven't had an opportunity to ask them, but uh, I wonder if they'd level with me on the fee. <laughs> Our guests tonight here on the Golden Age of Radio, Mary Jane Higby and Guy Sorrell. And we'll get to meet Guy Sorrell in 
just a few minutes on the program. But first of all, I want to talk about your moving to New York, if we may, Mary Jane, because it's a fascinating story. During your uh, formative years, the, the people in the business, the people who were uh, surrounding you in, in your career, kept telling you that... Uh, New York was the mecca for radio. Yes. And so in 1937, you decided to uh, do something about it. I decided to come east. It was the creative center. It still is, in essence, the, the, where, th where the real spark of the thing starts, I think. There's a the great activity takes place on the coast because they had such a vast uh, pool of people there with big names, you see. And... Uh, I never regretted going to New York because what I was doing out there was making about as much money as anybody was, I think, which was about a hundred dollars a week if you broke your neck. And um, half hour show would pay you twenty five or thirty dollars, and then Lux came along, and that was the first one that paid. Well, Mary Pickford's first show for Royal Gelatin, and then Lux paid fifty dollars for an hour show but you had to rehearse two or three days and the studios were so far apart they were all a thirty minute drive by car so you couldn't have conflicts it was very hard i remember turning down canter several times because i had lux and you just couldn't work them out and it's where you might be called for something that would take you up to a fee of two or three hundred dollars you couldn't always do it because mm -hmm, you wouldn't mm -hmm. the time was was used up now, in New York, things were more centrally located. There was a small radius there of the networks that you could get to them within a very few minutes. And then there was the great blessing of soap opera, of which we had none on the coast. Now, soap opera was great for women. There were a lot of women's parts. Any woman who was really very, very good could probably do four or five shows a day because we didn't have to memorize anything. We read it all from the script. And... Many were doing as much as seven during a day, seven soap operas. It was a great thing, this thing of having, uh, having to do things live. I had a friend, Mrs. Frank Lovejoy, and uh, Joan Banks was her name in those days, and she had a commercial that she had to do at NBC. And it was Saturday night at midnight, and she had one line. The announcer read a one-minute spiel, and Joni had to come in and say, I always use... Dream Shampoo. Now, no matter what she was doing, she had all oh, my commercials. Stop it. Go over to NBC and do this in New York. Well, she was at a party one night, and she said, Oh, my commercial. She ran down and jumped into a taxi and off to NBC and up to the eighth floor and up to the microphone, and the announcer read a perfect one-minute piece of copy, and she said, I always use Droon Shampoo. <laughs> 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 that was Saturday night. Well, Sunday, she got a wire from the sponsor <laughs> saying, we feel you've done this commercial too long. <laughs> that had to get changed in the <laughs> Isn't that great? I didn't know that when I wrote the book. She told me about it later. I've learned a lot of things since I wrote the book. Actors have come to me, and I said, now you tell me. Why did you tell me then? I, I enjoyed the uh, the story particularly about uh, you strapping yourself into the uh, the chair yes. <laughs> prior to a broadcast. Would you relate that story for it us? It was the first broadcast I did of When a Girl Marries, and I was extremely nervous because I wanted that job desperately. It was the first contract I ever had, and it meant an enormous amount to me because it meant a, re a security I knew about. I had been secure in the past five years, but I never knew it. Because every week you were thinking, now will I be called again next week? But I always was. But now I would have a contract with my name on it and somebody else's name on it, and I would be permanently engaged. So I was shaking all over. And Ken McGregor had made a strong fight to put me on the show against someone in the advertising agency who just happened not to like me or my work. He didn't know me personally. And I had finally achieved this, so I was terribly nervous, and I had a suit jacket on with a large belt buckle, and I sat down in a folding chair and kept my nose buried in that script and worked every second. I was keyed up to the nth degree. Then when I tried to get up, I found that I was tied to the chair, this belt <laughs> buckle. I couldn't figure out what it was. My icy fingers wouldn't disentangle me. And I saw the panicky look on the announcer's face because he'd ended his narration. And uh, the sound man rushed over to me and he realized he couldn't get me out of this position so he just picked up this chair and carried the chair <laughs> over the <laughs> microphone Thanks. and held it what did they view <laughs> well, <laughs> and somebody else i guess the announcer came around it was frank gallop then 
Frank came around and they worked together and got the buckle out <laughs> and finally <laughs> took the chair away. <laughs> and I played that whole scene so with someone holding a chair up against my seat. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, fortunately, you didn't, uh, or no one saw the humor in it at that particular moment, so you were it able wasn't to maintain funny to your me, composure. Right. It was a terrifying thing. It was just dreadful. It was the longest broadcast <laughs> of my whole life. <laughs> Well, anyway, I think it's about time that uh, we allowed Mary Jane Higby to uh, act for us on a soap opera. Ed, what do you have for us? Well, Mary Jane, I thought we'd surprise you tonight and just play an excerpt from one of your uh, early soaps and see if you can remember a little about it. When a girl marries. Walter Baker Chocolate Products, favorites with the homemakers of America for nearly 200 years, present When a Girl Marries. This tender human story of young married life is dedicated to everyone who has ever been in love. Now, when a girl marries, the story of Joan and Harry Davis. Earlier this evening, Harry discovered that his car had broken down and the return trip to Beechwood would be impossible until the morning. Even though his speech was a great success, the idea of leaving Joan alone in the old farmhouse is a constant worry. But Betty, realizing fate has played into her hands, is doing her best to cheer Harry, to take advantage of being alone with him. Now, as we begin our story... Oh, it's the phone. It's ringing. Oh, it's too cold to get up. I can't get up. I just can't. It's like ice in this room. Oh, all right, all right. What did you have to call so late for? Oh, where's my robe? My slippers. Oh, I can't light the light. I can't, that's all. Yes, I'm coming, I'm coming. Oh, it's so cold. Hello? Joan, thank God you've answered. Are you all right? Yes, I guess so, but I'm awfully cold. Were you asleep? Yes, but I'll be awake in a minute. Oh, Harry, the furnace went out. But you're all right? Yes. I will be once I'm warm again. You called me, darling. I... Oh, yes, long ago to ask you how to start the furnace. Did you get Irma over there? No, only Sammy and me. There's nobody else here. I'll be there as fast as I can get there in the morning. All right, Harry. You stay in bed as late as you can, and I'll attend to everything about the furnace when I get there. How's Sammy? Oh, he's asleep in our bed. I took him in with me. I was afraid to sleep alone. Oh, I'm glad you've got him there with you. Now listen, darling, don't worry about a thing. Harry... Yes, what is it? I... I... What's the matter? I don't know, I... What do you mean you don't know? What made you cry out like that? Something... It's dark here, I haven't got a light. Something... What? Why well, can't you say what it is? What's the matter, Joan? I... An awfully cold breeze suddenly. As if... As if... As if what, Joan? What are you talking about? While I was standing here talking to you, a cold wind swept through the house. You said the furnace was out. Not like that. Like what? Can't you say like what? Was if... As if a door was open. Or a window, or... Have you got any windows open? No. Well, then, where could the breeze come from? I don't know. It's not blowing now. Oh, Harry, I'm frightened. Frightened of what, Joan? And I'll be there by morning. There's somebody in this house. No, darling, you're imagining things. Look, you go along up the stairs to your room. Harry, I heard something. I heard a sound. Harry. Darling, there's nobody there. You only imagine. Harry, what'll I do? I'm all alone. Listen, darling, you're imagining things. No. No, there is somebody in the house. He just knocked over something. He... Oh, Harry. Joan, for heaven's sakes, don't ring off now. Now listen to what I tell you to do. You know where my revolver is? No. Yes. Oh, Harry, what'll I do? He's in the house. My revolver's in the desk drawer. It's loaded, Joan. Can you 
Just go over and get it. Come right back to the phone. I... Can you? I don't, I don't know. I'm shaking, so... My legs. Harry, I've got to get upstairs to Sammy. No, don't listen to me. Do as I tell you. Do you hear any sounds now? I don't know. Oh, Harry, why aren't you here? Don't keep still a minute and listen. Do you hear any sounds now, Joe? No. No. Yes. Yes, I heard something. I... Joe, get that gun, will you? Send the desk drawer. I can't. I can't. I don't know where he is. I'm afraid. I don't know what to do. Joan, I'll get somebody there in a minute. Only keep talking so I'll know you're all right. Keep talking, Joan. I can't. I, I'm afraid. Oh, Harry. I heard it again. It's closer now. Harry. Harry. Joan, for heaven's sake, speak to me. She doesn't answer. She doesn't answer. Well, that's quite a story. I'd like to know what happens next. That's an excerpt from uh, When a Girl Marries, starring Mary Jane Higby, going back about uh, 30 years, I guess, to 1941. You're listening to The Golden Age of Radio with Dick Bertell on Radio 1080, WTIC Hartford. Brought to you by Burrett Mutual Savings, serving Central Connecticut since 1889. And by WTIC. Do you want to get rich? Rich, you say? Who doesn't? Well, here's how. Save a little each payday. And do it where little deposits are welcome. At the Big B, Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. A small sum saved regularly will accumulate astoundingly fast. Hard work, frugal living, regular saving. All old-fashioned virtues, but the only sure way to succeed. Even to become rich. The place to save before you spend... The Big B, the big strong bank built on faithful small deposits from loyal depositors. Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. Four convenient offices, New Britain, West Hartford, and on the border of Rocky Hill and Wethersfield. Don't wait. Start saving small. Or big now. Member FDIC. Guy Sorrell is your husband. Guy Sorrell is uh, with us here in the studio also, and... uh, Guy, we haven't had a chance to uh, chat with you before going on the air, and of course you haven't written a book about your radio experiences, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so uh, where does your career begin? Well, actually, it began on Broadway, mm-hmm. right right away. I uh, played the part of Clemenceau, the French Prime Minister. I was then 26, and I played him at the age of 79 in a play about uh, Woodrow Wilson and the Versailles Treaty. Uh, I got very good notices, but unfortunately the play um, opened three weeks after Pearl Harbor, and the public couldn't have been less interested in the Versailles Treaty, Mm -hmm. or Wilson, (laughs) or Clemenceau, or anything to do with it. Also, one of my (coughs) friends in New York who belonged to the same club is um, Judson Phillips. I don't know if you know him. He's a writer. I've heard the name. And uh, you were talking about things that went wrong on shows, and this was a show that uh, he was writing called Now It Can Be Told, started just after the war. And uh, I was on that one day, and usually, you know, when the actors came in, they, they sort of turned, Where, where's my part? I'm on page so-and-so, page 16. They made a mental note of it and, matter of fact, kept the script open to that page. But that day, for some strange reason, I followed the script. I don't know what led me to do that. And there was an elderly actor on that show, Martin Gable was the narrator, who suddenly got to a word, a name, he fluffed and he said he tried it again and couldn't get it he tried it a third time and then said oh the hell with it <laughs> <laughs> he walked away from the mic <laughs> well Martin's narration was coming in and Martin took a deep breath and I was looking at the script and he said the freighter Marianne was on a northwest 
<laughs> and I came in, I said, heading, and continued on her course. <laughs> oh, really? Did Martin regain By that his time, Mar Martin came back in again after he'd done. Uh, I think that would tend to sober you up, too, if, if uh, the actor playing opposite you managed to retain his composure. I, I've had that experience where... Uh, mm -hmm you suddenly become embarrassed within yourself because you realize what you have done or almost caused to occur and the other actor has been perhaps at that moment a little yeah. more professional than you and well uh, you I don't think it was being more professional I think you caught a look of the director oh. whose name was Tony Leader sure and he was right. dead white, <laughs> yeah. was dead Tony, white. And Tony Leader was a very dark-skinned chap <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen him feel that pale in my life <laughs> did you managed to keep both a, a Broadway uh, and uh, a radio profession going at the same time? No, I, I remember when I was starting, you see, I started the American Academy, uh, started uh, at a relatively late age, I, and um, I remember being given uh, tickets to a broadcast at NBC. They had audiences then li on live broadcasts. And I remember sitting there and looking at all these actors who were in this show and thinking isn't it terrible all these poor actors picking up maybe ten fifteen dollars between plays I didn't realize <laughs> <laughs> the, the advantage the financial advantages of radio so I went into the theater and I stayed in the theater for about uh, three four years I, I played uh, as a matter of fact I played in Hartford in the Patriots mm -hmm. the uh, by Sidney Sidney Kingsley is in the Bushnell Memorial Auditorium, which was a pretty large house yeah, and still, still is. is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then when I came back from that, I went into radio, and I stayed in radio pretty much for about twelve years. Uh, and I didn't do any theater, and then I went back into the theater and out of it and back in. And I'm going in again now. And uh, TV, of course, you've had some experience with TV. Oh yes, but um, as far as TV is concerned, I've been concentrating on the commercials, either on camera or voiceover. What were some of the radio roles you played? Could you just give us a little uh, recap? I was Warden Laws. 20,000 Years in Sing Sing. That's right. And then uh, one show that I particularly like to recall is one that was called You Are There. started out at CBS. Yeah. I have a few of mm -hmm. those, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. They uh, recreated and some of these uh, events. Yes. yes. And I was on every show for the entire run of the series, two and a half years, I was the only actor who was permanently on it as opposed to the announcers or the uh -huh. news newsmen. You remember the eruption of Mount Vesuvius oh, then? Of course, yes. <laughs> You've got an education as well as a, a career. My steady it. job was the signature voice, You are there! You remember that? <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, then sometimes I would do nothing but that. Sometimes I'd do a small part. Sometimes I'd do medium part. And sometimes I'd do a lead. I played Napoleon on two separate occasions. One, I think, the uh, embarkation for Elba, and the other one, I don't remember what it was. And then I was uh, William the Conqueror in the Battle of Hastings. Mm -hmm. And th those, those were very interesting shows. That was a do. program uniquely suited for radio. Oh, it, had yes. a, it had a great run on television, but it really wasn't a no. television show. No, it it never not. did work properly. No. I recall, for example, listening to... Uh, well, for example, the uh, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, the destruction yeah. of Pompeii, and mm -hmm. an announcer describing it, and then suddenly yelling, "Look out for that cable!" You know that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it was marvelous because you could accept this, yes. but you couldn't accept it if obviously you were looking at it and seeing a video track no. there or something of no, that nature. No, it, it it didn't it didn't really work. Oh. But the interesting thing is that there there you had a show that was admirably suited to radio, and it was on the air. CBS kept it on the air for two and a half years, and it never sold commercially. As soon as it went to television, for which it was not suited, it sold right away. Mm. For goodness mm. sakes. That's amazing. And we've got to play one of these shows. Uh, we, we can't talk about it all that long without hearing at least an excerpt from You Are There. This is John Daly at Runnymede, England. The hour has come and gone on this 19th day of June, 1215. The hour when King John agreed to sign the Magna Carta. But the king has still not left Windsor Castle, seven miles away from these council meadows on the Thames, and the patience of the barons gathered here at Runnymede is at the breaking point. After three days of haggling with the king's emissaries, the 49 articles of the Magna Carta still remain the barons' unconditional peace terms to end the civil war which has been raging up and down this English isle for more than a year. If John does not arrive, and is that shortly... There is the strongest possibility that the barons will take to the sword once again. Mark on Ronnie the Mead, and June the 19th, 1215. You are there. Now, the 
barons of their forces have been waiting. Four and more gaily colored civilians rise over these meadows to quarter this host. Here at Runnymede stands the bulk of the might and power of England. 300 barons or more are here with at least 2,000 knights in full armor. With their host of retainers, yeomen, and other fighting men, they constitute the greatest striking force ever assembled on English soil. Spears, pikes, battle axes, swords, crossbows, burnished helmets and armor, a gleaming sea of deadly metal in the springtime sun. The leader of the barons, my Lord Robert Fitzwalter, is with us now at our CBS microphone. He wears link chain armor under a white circle. His squire stands a short distance away, a few feet from us, holding his helmet, his sword, and his shield. My lord, my lord, do you think King John means to break his word and not sign the charter? What King John means to do, I know not. He has shown bad faith before, he may show bad faith again. And exactly what will you do, sir, if King John does not appear to sign the charter? I have said it before, and I will say it again. We will march on Windsor Castle and tear it down, stone by stone on his stubborn head. But, my lord, suppose this meeting here at Runnymede is a ruse, a trap set for you by King John. What if instead of arriving peacefully, sir, his forces come charging onto this field hoping to take you by surprise? That is a possibility. But if John Cotsdorf chooses that manner of talking deep, you will find us quite ready to answer in kind. My Lord Fitzwalter, many observers think that King John will never accept Article 49 of the Charter. Sir, we are beyond the point of being concerned with what King John thinks of any particular article in the Charter. We've haggled about it quite enough. It stands as it is. He signs today. And that's before the shadows of our swords grow much longer, or mayhap England will be without a king. And if it comes to such a crisis, sir, do you think the people of England will stand in back of you? Uh, the people? What mean you by the people? Why, uh, the common folk, my lord, this water, the multitude gathered over there along the fringes of the meadow. Ah, oh, yes, the people. I presume they stand behind us. But I fail to see in what manner they are concerned. But does not the Charter talk of the rights of all free men, my lord? Free men, yes. But free men are people. Free men are free men. Noble, nice lord, not serf, yeomanry. But if the people do not stand to profit by the Magna Carta, my lord, yes, then can we not... Forgive me, I have weighed your matters on my mind at this moment. Thank you, my lord. Oh, Mr. Walter. The leader of the barons is walking away now, back to his lieutenants who are gathered before Fitzwalter's pavilion. My colleague, Don Hollenbeck, in his CBS mobile unit, has reached Windsor Castle and should be set up to report soon. Meanwhile, here at Runnymede, we're at the south end of the meadow. To our right are huge crowds, masses of people who have come from one end of England to the other to witness what may happen today. These are the people. The very people who loom not very large in the mind of the leader of the barons, Lord Fitzwalter. Ken Roberts is among them with a CBS microphone, and it might be interesting to hear what their thoughts are. So over to Ken Roberts. This great crowd of people have been gathering for days from all over England. Some have come on foot, some in jockey carts, some even down the Thames on boats. Many have slept in the open fields, bringing their provisions with them. There are men women and children, entire households. Here, for example, is one member of this crowd, a man dressed in a light tan tunic made from flaxen cloth. Friend, what part of the island are you from? I come from Northumberland. Northumberland, eh? Aye. Well, that's quite a distance to travel, isn't it? Aye. Goodly journey. Three days on my way, I was. You must be very interested in the things conference to have made such a long journey. Aye, I... I would know what will be. What will happen to your crops while you're away? No crops are lie this year. You mean you haven't planted at all? Nay, hey, not a seed. And why not? I will not say. Could it be that your last year's wheat was seized by the king's bailiff? I will not say. Or perhaps the baron steward seized your barley? Nay, it was no... But I will not say. I see. Which side would you like to see win out today, the barons or the king? I would have peace. Not the seed will I plant till there be peace. Enough of strife, say I. Enough of barons and kings stealing poor man's crops, say I. 
I will not stay. I'm come from Northumberland, and I would have peace. Thank you. While we were talking, however, a message was handed to me. The Cardinal Subdeacon Pandolf, the Pope Cemetery to the court of King John, is just arrived at Windsor Castle. So over to Don Hollenbeck. You can probably hear names as the drawbridge goes up from the moat following the admittance of Cardinal Pandolf. The Pope's emissary arrived just two minutes ago, and with him came the seven bishops of England. What that means is anybody's guess. There must be a thousand of the king's loyal men here. And at the microphone with me now, across the moat from the castle, is Lord Fitzrogers. He's a spokesman for the king, a loyal nobleman. He's been very close to the king's council for many years. He wears link chain armor. His squire stands by, holding his helmet and sword, that long, two-handed sword that King John's brother, Richard the Lionhearted, wielded so famously in the Holy Land Crusades and on the continent. My Lord Fitzrogers, does Cardinal Pandolf's arrival here at Windsor Castle today mean that His Holiness has thrown his support behind King John? Well, it would pleasure me greatly, good sir, to answer your question, but in truth I know no more than you do. I am not privy to the King's Council. Well, all right then. Do you think the King is going to sign the Magna Carta? The King has promised to sign. But if I may speak frankly, I fear the consequences of that signing. What do you mean by that, my lord? A lot of people believe it's for the good of England. Perhaps. Perhaps. But then again, perhaps not, young sir. You see, in the historical development of a folk land, there are times when unity should be cherished more than feudal liberty. The barons have been fighting each other for a long time, storming each other's castles robbing each other's lands, impoverishing England, weakening her strength. John is ambitious for England, not for himself. But, my Lord Fitzrogers, the barons made the point that they would have England a strong and united power, a power to be feared on the continent. Ah, uh, on the contrary, young sir. If the Magna Carta is signed, England will have a multitude of rulers instead of one. And as the Holy Book says, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. For we shall be a prey to every marauding power on the continent. Ah, no, young sir, it is a fine point, you will agree. This Magna Carta of which you speak may be a good thing for the Baron. But is it a good thing for England? Is it a good thing for England? Thank you, my lord Fitzrogers. Well, certainly in all the 49 years King John Lackland has lived, in all the 16 years he's sat on the throne of England, he has never faced a more crucial moment than this. We're going to move up with the king's forces, but now John Daly at running... That's a, a very, very impressive uh, format to uh, present history in. Mary Jane, was there any feeling, any difference in feeling on the part of the actor or actress in doing a nighttime show such as Lux or Perry Mason from a daytime show, did it seem more important to you in oh, any way? yes. I don't think anyone took the daytime serials, or very few people took them seriously. The first serious moment might be when you counted the pages of your script to be sure they were in the right order just before you went on the air. There was a marked difference between a, a beginner in radio and one who'd been at it a long time. The beginner would count his page, would look through his pages to see if he was in a lot of the script, and he was in a lot of the script, he was delighted. Whereas the old timer would look through and said, Oh, I'm through on page one, isn't that nice? <laughs> <laughs> because he was getting paid just as much. <laughs> then, of course, the nighttime shows, I used to do a lot of cavalcades, Cavalcade of America. And um, that, of course, was, a, I suppose, the plushiest of them all. Uh, the actors would all wear dinner jackets, tuxedos, and uh, evening dresses. And it was a very elaborate production with an audience and everything, and lights and everything else. There was one actor who uh, usually, oh, uh, usually in radio, always marked his script, because we all marked our scripts. We made cuts uh, in, in pencil or pen. And he was accustomed to making his cuts with a red pencil. And uh, he'd never been on the cavalcade before. Well, the, uh, it was on the air, and suddenly the lights went down, and red lights came up on the 
stage. <laughs> oh, I can guess what would happen then. Well, you know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> the, red, the red lights just drained all the red from his script. He didn't know what was cut, what wasn't cut. He couldn't see his markings. Oh, he was in a mess. He finally had to drop his script completely and read over somebody else's <laughs> shoulder. And we took such a casual attitude. We're, I'm really ashamed of it when I think of it now. But more than once... I remember seeing someone go over to an announcer who was plowing through particularly difficult copy and just light his, uh, <laughs> take a match or lighter and just light the script and let it burn in his hands. <laughs> that doesn't go on today, and I'm not about to say that doesn't go on in television. It doesn't go on in the uh, in the industry today, in, in, in radio. You don't seem to, to have the desire to set someone's copy on fire. I, I, perhaps we're a bit more serious today. I don't know. We have a lot of fun, but that seems to be... I a think <laughs> that uh, well, it was, uh, a lot of the pretense is gone, but there was so much of that, I think that you finally felt as though you should really do something to blow it away, <laughs> so, so we'd line each other's <laughs> script, you know. You just want to break those bounds occasionally. Well, we're going to uh, break the line of our conversation for just a moment or two, if we may, and uh, get back to Cavalcade of America and... And you, Guy Sorrell, because uh, I think our audience would like very much to hear an excerpt from this wonderful program. Ed, what do you have for us? I have an excerpt, Dick, uh, which features Raymond Massey, and I think when you hear it, you'll, you can appreciate the quality of this production. It's very, very well done indeed. Cavalcade of America. The DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Raymond Massey in Wire to the West on Cavalcade of America. And here is Raymond Massey. Good evening. Tonight, the DuPont Company brings Cavalcade of America back for its 15th year on the air. I've been here many times before in many roles. And on this opening night, I'm here in a new character. Hiram Sibley, a man whose work has touched the lives of every man and woman in America. And here's the story. It's Washington, D.C., back in the middle of the last century. Mr. Hiram Sibley of Rochester, New York, enters a sleepy little telegraph office. Anyone here? Hello? Hello? Come in. I hear you. I ain't deep. I heard you the first time. I want to send this telegram to Rochester. Oh, Rochester. Got it read out? Of course. Rochester's pretty expensive. You'd save yourself a lot of money if you send it to New York. Even Boston would be cheaper. Will you please send this to Rochester? All right, if you like. I was just advising you. Let's see now, October 4, 1849, Mrs. Elizabeth Sibley, your wife? Yes, yeah, but why? Just curious. Mrs. Elizabeth Sibley, business successfully concluded. Leave Washington today, arrive home Tuesday, kiss the children. Love, Hiram, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Kissing the children is going to cost you extra. Fees a dollar and seventy-five cents for ten words, twenty-five cents a word thereafter. Still want to kiss him? Of course. That'll be two dollars and fifty cents. Ah, there you are. Uh, when will it arrive? Well, now, sir, that is a mighty good question, a mighty fine one. When will it arrive? Well, now let's see if we can figure that out. From Washington here to New York. Well, that'll be quick. That's our own line. So let's say it'll get to New York about, oh, eight tonight. That means it'll start upstate New York tomorrow morning. Why not tonight? Oh, it ain't our line from New York to Albany. No, no, that's another line. That means it has to be took over to the other company by messenger. And messengers, they quit at seven. Starts upstate tomorrow morning, gets to Albany, then switch to another line. Maybe it'll be on its way to Buffalo by evening. But why Buffalo? I want this sent to Rochester. Yes, but we've just been informed that we ain't on talking terms with the company that's got a line into Rochester. We send to Buffalo. And there, it would probably be put in the mail. The stagecoach takes a day from Buffalo to Rochester. Oh, better say two. Um, well? Well, I'd say it's got a pretty fair chance of arriving in Rochester early Wednesday morning. But I'll be there myself on Tuesday. 
Yeah, so you will. <laughs> well, wouldn't that be nice? Your wife won't have to bother going down to the telegraph office to get the message. You can pick it up yourself. <laughs> One hundred years ago, the infant telegraph industry teetered on the brink of chaos. Over 50 different lines, large and small, were operating along the eastern seaboard of the country, a few even reaching timidly westward towards the Mississippi. But it was progress without pattern. Messages more often than not failed to get through. Rates were raised and lowered without reason, without warning. And that was a bare hundred years ago. I tell you, Hiram, it's a tremendous opportunity. You've just got to come in with it. Build another telegraph line. Hmm. Judge Selden, seems to me the country is overstocked with telegraph lines already. And they're all of them bad. Oh, Elizabeth. Oh, Mrs. Sibley. Oh, sit down, please. You go right ahead with your talk. I'll pour the coffee. Well, Hiram, can I count you in? I don't see it, Judge. You don't? No. It seems like a ridiculous venture, at least at this time. Right after Morse invented the telegraph, every Johnny and his cousin Mary began building telegraph lines. The result is that the country is suffering from a bad case of telegraphitis. But, Hiram, the country's growing and the telegraph will grow with it. Maybe, maybe so. Maybe when the men who run the telegraph industry begin to get some idea of what the public expects, what it wants, maybe then it will amount to something. Well, I must say I'm disappointed in your reaction, Hiram. That's the way I feel about it, Judge. If things stand now, I want no part of the telegram. Well, then, I suppose there's no use taking up more of your time. I'll be getting on. Oh, but you will stay and have some coffee. I'm sorry, afraid not, Mrs. Sibley. It's late. It's past my bedtime. No hard feelings, Judge. Oh, of course not. Won't change your mind, Hiram? No. Well, good night. Good night, Judge. Good night. That surprises me that Judge is usually so sound in his business judgment, but this wild scheme, telegram. I don't see it. Uh, I think I'll sit and read in the parlor for a bit, Elizabeth. Have you seen that book I was reading? Uh, the Federalist Papers? Uh-huh. Oh, I put it on your desk in the study. Is it an interesting book? Very interesting. The arguments of Hamilton, Madison, and some of the other great statesmen of the time for the need of a strong national government. You wouldn't think they had to fight for the Constitution, argue for it, but they had to. They had to show that the country would never get anywhere as long as the states kept apart, each rivaling the other. They showed that the only way the country could survive was with a strong central authority. Hmm. Seems to me, Hiram, that that's just what the telegraph companies need. Hmm? Yeah? Well, isn't that right? You mean some central authority? Well, something to bring them together so they can serve the people efficiently. So they can give the country what it needs, so responsible, dependable, cheap way of sending messages across the country. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm going up to bed. Good night, dear. Good night. Let's put it this way, Judge. I changed my mind. You astonish me, Hiram. Why? Well, you seem so set in your views when we spoke together last week. <laughs> the only things I know of that never change their minds are mad dogs and politicians. <laughs> I'm neither. I'm a businessman. I'll come in with you, Judge, but with one reservation. And that? Simply this. The main objective of our business will not be just to build another telegraph line to the Mississippi. Our goal will be to gather all of the telegraph lines in our territory under a single vigorous enterprise, one that will serve the public... First, last, and always. On that basis, I'll come in. On that basis, Hiram, it's a deal. On September 6th, 1850, Hiram Sibley, Judge Samuel Selden, and a group of other prominent Rochester businessmen formed the New York and Mississippi Valley Printing Telegraph Company. As soon as all the details were set, Hiram Sibley, battered old traveling bag in hand, began to wander along the highways and byways of the back country of the Middle West. He began to lay the groundwork of his dream. Hello there, blacksmith. I say, hello. Hiram, are you Mr. Kittleheim? Well, my name is Hiram Sibley. I'm very glad to meet you. Shoe? Got a horse to shoe? 
Well, bring the critter in. No, I said I was glad to meet you. I'm a trifle deep. Emmy, you come here and find out what this fellow wants. Come in. Uh, pretty hot weather, isn't it, Mr. Kittleheim? No, ain't gonna vote for that fella. Gonna vote straight wig ticket. You be wanting something, mister? Yes, ma'am. My name is Hiram Sibley. I've been told that your husband owns some stock in the Cleveland and Cincinnati Telegraph Company. Is that right? Wished it was, but it is. What's he saying, Emmy? He ain't said nothing yet, Pa. Well, then I'll get back to work. No, no, wait. I, I'd like to talk to you about the stock. Uh, do you have it here? Part of it. Part of it? Had a mighty fine engraving of Jackson on it. We got it framed inside. Pretty picture. You've got the stock framed? No, just the picture. Cut it out and fixed it real nice. But where's the rest of the certificate? Hmm? Let me see now. Oh, sure enough. It's patched over the leak we had in the kitchen. Mighty strong paper. Hold out the water real good. Well, what's he saying? He ain't doing any saying, Paul. I'm doing all the saying so far. Well, get to it. Get to it. Mrs. Kittleheim, I'd like to buy the stock. You're fooling. No, I'm not. I'll give you $20 for it. Paul, he said... I heard him. <laughs> ain't you deep to hear a fool offering good cash for a water patch? Emmy, go fetch the picture and the paper before this here sucker squirms off in the hook. How much should you save? The friendly folks at the Big B, Barrett Mutual Savings Bank, generally say that you should have six months' pay in savings. Once reached, your savings goal will depend upon both the wants and needs of your family. Children need $10,000 or thereabout to finance college. Or perhaps your goal is the down payment for a home, money for a more comfortable retirement, or a new car. Don't wait another day. Stop in at Main, Slater Road, Corbin's Corner, or Weather Rock offices of the Barrett Mutual Savings Bank. With passbook savings from 5% to certificates of deposit as high as 6%, the savings people at the Big B have a program tailored to fit your specific needs. So don't wait. Make a date at Barrett Mutual Savings Bank. Member FDIC. Mary Jane, would you, <clears throat> would you like to go back to, to those days? You mean a, <clears throat> a world war and a depression? Oh, you see, now you're remembering <laughs> the, the realities of, of those no, years. No, we, we had do too many soap <laughs> operas on the air. I don't mm. think we need all that back again, no. I th as I told you in the beginning, I think things are better now than they were then. I hope so. I think things have improved. I think... Uh, that uh, there's a great deal of sameness, but there's also, um, it's, it's more, uh, to me it's more honest, the whole thing is more honest. More on, th the cards are on the table more, and I think it's better. Well, there's I a think there's still struggle in the world generally than yes. there was then. Yeah, you say what yes. you think today, that's for sure. I think so, and uh, I love some of the radio shows. I really listen quite a bit. Well, I'm, I'm afraid we're running out of time, Mary Jane and, and Guy Sorrell, and uh, before we... Uh, take leave of you, I certainly would like to mention that your book, Mary Jane, Tune In Tomorrow, is now in paperback, published by Ace. Has some good pictures in it, too, Ed. Yes, I think the uh, many of the stars we featured on the show are in there, as well as many others, Dick. It's highly recommended. All right, well, Mary Jane Higby and Guy Sorrell, it's been great fun visiting with you tonight, and I hope you'll come back and see us again. Thank you. Thank you. Until next time, this is Dick Bertel. This is Ed Corcoran. Good night. Tonight's edition of the Golden Age of Radio was brought to you by Burrett Mutual Savings Bank and WTIC. Studio engineer Bob Sherego. The program was edited and produced by Brian Hartnett. Pepper Young's Family. The story of your friends, the Youngs, is brought to you by Cameron.